Okay. Okay, so we're going to start the second session with four other teams. Uh, I just remember that the, the conference is, uh, can be followed on streaming, and the people that are following us on streaming can ask questions through the application, okay, just for everyone to know. And, um, and to you, <laughs> just try to be on time because we have all, all, already 20 minutes delay, so just try to be on time. Uh, so, the teams we have to now is Johansen Skofsted Architect, Architects, Fala, Geoffrey Barreau, and Nundo. Uh, I didn't say it in the right order, but anyway. The first one is Sebastian Skofsted um, from Denmark. Okay, they, they work really in, in the, let's say, architecture, maybe not so in context with, you no, know, like the previous teams we have that work together with community and involve them in doing projects. They, they do really like buildings, uh, very poetical, sensitive, with a tactile approach them, uh, where materials, atmospheres, I think, are very important. Uh, so it's your turn. Thank you to the Architects Association of Europe for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and we have already seen a lot of interesting presentations and uh, ideas and suggestions this morning. Um, I'm a Danish architect under 40 and uh, together with architect Søren Johansen, I founded Johansen Skovsted Architecture in 2014 and uh, we are based, we are rather small office based in Copenhagen, uh, currently with, can you unlock this, sorry. It's not working. Um, currently with uh, seven people. Sorry, it's not uh, working. Um, anyway, um, so, yeah, so this is an image from our office. Um, so, um, when I was a student, I was traveling and studying abroad. So I did one year of, uh, of Erasmus exchange studies in the Netherlands, and afterwards I did an internship in a smaller, rather unknown office at that time in uh, Belgium. And after graduating, so after being a, a graduate architect, I worked for the first three years abroad in the same office in Belgium, architecting the following to you. And this gave, of course, a lot of interesting um, knowledge and experience, but not at least uh, great network of uh, personal and professional relations throughout Europe and uh, this network has been wider broadened the last recent years um, by meeting other colleagues uh, not only from Denmark but from around Europe to share knowledge and experiences like uh, we do today so um, for instance it's the third time this year I meet you Philip um, to get things to touch you and move things forward, it's, um, we believe in our office and it's our experience that, uh, that you need a personal commitment and ownership throughout the design process. And this is something that uh, we often find in smaller personal driven offices. And uh, in that sense, it's, uh, it's really essential to create create possibilities for smaller offices and young offices to get started and um, not at least to get the first permission uh, and first build reference. This is our first um, commission, um, or this is the landscape. It's a very specific flat, wet landscape in the west of Denmark where we had to build uh, new visitor facilities like a new bird watchtower for this chip on a bird sanctuary. And what is characterizing the way that we work in each project, um, and also in this case, is that together with finding a, taking a starting point in the, in the program and the context, we're also trying to de find the initial design idea together with a technique. So in this instance, we found this local um, steel factory making these steel pylons, and we developed the tower based on the, on the production facility of this, um, this uh, technique. 
And uh, here you see some uh, um, pieces of the tower being built in the factory and later placed on site uh, in the specific landscape. So this is a this is a structure that is like fully optimized. Everything is um, structural, and um, there's no div division between cladding and um, and the structure itself and the expression. When we were applying our first assignment, um, we didn't have an office yet. And uh, to get these kind of smaller public assignments, it's um, when you do these applications, you need to prove a lot of things that you obviously can't prove. So this is really like a, a problem. So we were like extremely lucky that we were both, so and I working in a more established office at that time, and the owner of this office, Jens Bertelsen, he actually offered to be um, part of this application to guarantee the project to the client. So it was not like an artistic collaboration as you often see, which is also interesting, but for us this um, gave us the possibility because it was really like our own um, project, it gave us the possibility to fully develop our own architectonic approach and um, way of working. This is, um, this is the first project to be um, finished from our office. It's a, transformation of three existing pump stations along the river Skjern, uh, also in the west of Denmark. And um, we took a starting point in this, um, this is like the existing building with this concrete relief, and we added um, new wooden structures on top of the existing buildings as a reinterpretation of the, of the existing um, concrete uh, relief. And this uh, owner of the more established office, he um, he, he did this uh, collaboration, he offered this of pure generosity because, as he said, when he was a young architect, he was helped in the same way. Um, another thing that we would like to um, share from our experience... What is this? Um, from our... This is not... Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> another thing that I would like to share from our experience so far is that... Um, that we have actually been rather successful in getting things, our first projects built in the end. And we think it has also a lot to do with the fact that we are very much into um, building cost and buildability and uh, to really keep the tight budget, uh, even getting below the budget. This is a, this is a project that is um, about the transformation of a common garden in a typical Copenhagen city block. It was built in uh, different phases. The landscape phase was built uh, from the owners' association's uh, maintenance budget. In the more recent years, we had the chance to also get um, private clients or even uh, small uh, special invitations. Uh, this is a reinterpretation of historic cuts in the landscape, and um, and this is a customized brass shelving for. Um, that we were invited to do for the for the official residence of the Danish Prime Minister. And this is a current project that we are working on right now, which is for also for a private client. It's um, um, it's a combined office and warehouse, and um, and we were asked to uh, we had to work in uh, concrete and prefabricated concrete elements. So we are looking for new possibilities of working with this technique. Based on, based on our own personal experience and on the fact that we can see how much it means to have uh, your first built reference to get started as an architect on your own, uh, and also what we have experienced, because the later projects that i just been sharing, I think we really got these projects because we had our first built reference to, to prove and show. So, um, so Based on this experience, because not everyone can be as lucky as we have been to, um, to be helped in this way from your former boss or your current boss at that moment. Um, so we are suggesting this, uh, like, uh, that the European Union can support a program uh, making uh, more younger architects having similar possibilities. So more specific specifically, um, we are suggesting a cross-European program involving clients, young architects, or even mentorships. Um, and it could become a, like a prestigious thing to, uh, 
even to be a mentor and not at least to participate uh, in this kind of competition or program as a, as a young architect or, um, and not at least of course to to win an assignment and what would be like really important criteria should be that it's it's a small assignment with a, a real um, project to be built and uh, one criteria to participate could be that you don't have uh, uh, an actual build reference in your portfolio yet so you could say it's a little bit like upside down of what we always see um, when applying um, competitions so we have in the past seen uh, cross-European competitions like uh, European focusing on large-scale projects and rarely um, resulting in build references and not at least in in, uh, in build um, projects for the cities, even from the winners. Uh, so we're hoping that the European Union would be thinking about supporting clients, being public or private, uh, by doing um, considering a kind of new cross-European competition program and the support could be financially but also uh, in know-how and organizing this kind of, um, of program and uh, I believe that it could result in a startup of new offices otherwise not having the possibility to get started and not at least for new innovative projects um, because there are many talented young architects uh, not getting the full um, possibility of sharing the talent, and I think this could be indeed different. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Sebastian, for, well, for showing us your projects, but also for asking the European, uh, European Union to get involved in no, uh, helping the young architects. Uh, now we've got uh, Geoffrey Barreau, who comes from Toulouse. <clears throat> He's been working a lot um, with empty buildings and trying to find an, a, new, a new function with these buildings. And doing these projects, he's been also involving the people that live and work around them uh, as a, something important you know, as part of your work. So thank you. Very much. So actually, um, I grew up in a little town, in a little village in the south of France, and I really wanted to introduce myself by showing you this picture because uh, it's where I grew up in a real community where people co really collaborate, uh, and everybody knows everybody's, but actually people can help each other. Your neighborhood knows maybe what you really don't want him to know about you, but after it's really good to feel alive in this kind of community. And for me, it's what architects can help in their project when they design a public spaces or building to think of the social, uh, the sociality of the space. So I wanted to show you this uh, screenshot of one of my favorite movies called Mon Oncle from Jacques Tati uh, from 1958. And you can see how the, in France we demolish all the, the houses in order to build new buildings 10 years after the, second war, the World War II. And my question was um, why are we still doing the same now? We just removed and demolished all the buildings of the 60s. And I really think that we don't uh, have the relevant question about to think how people really, what people really need, and also uh, why projects are still uh, from the top to the down, and why we don't do bottom up project. So my final project was um, a project about uh, asking why we are still building office building when we still have a lot of empty buildings. I did a double degree and every day I was passing in front of this um, office's building and I had the opportunity to, to visit and to study this neighborhood called Bordelong. And after six months of diagnostic, I I noticed that the three buildings on the right side were actually occupied only for 
20% after five years. So they were brand new and the developer in Toulouse were still developing and building of, uh, offices. And the other part, they were like social dwellings with a lot of people with a really bad vision of this neighborhood and asking why are still uh, people living outside in the street and we have all these um, square meters empty. So we start meeting people of the neighborhood, like this woman, and we start drawing with them their own uh, mental map of the neighborhood in order to understand what representation do they have of the neighborhood and how can we help them to take the power and to design real projects with them. So we also did guided tour in the neighborhood in order to meet the people who were working there in, and to meet the people who were living in the neighborhood. And we start developing workshop with the children of the neighborhood and also the inhabitant. And we had at the end a lot of little ideas in order to improve the everyday life of the people and who which really cost nothing so at the end of this project i managed thanks the ataa award to keep uh, working on this project of how can we reuse or use an empty building and i had to handle with the opportunity of working as architect and also to collaborate with other people from uh, social um, works or designers and people from other brand, um, domain of um, architecture and in order to ask how can we build a city without freezing a master plan and how can we experiment our project I founded two structures, one my architecture studio, and another structure, Agence Intercalaire, who works together. And one of our first projects is to open uh, a student residence, which was empty for five years. It's a property of the army, French army. And thanks to the ATAA project, the government started to ask me, OK, how can we do if we want to open this building? And they started thinking on their side, and they said, OK, it's too expensive. It's almost 300,000 uh, euros, and it's too dangerous, so we let the building empty. And after three years, they agreed to me to visit the building, and I started to study it, and I said, OK, I think it will only cost 150 euros, so let's try. And they say, OK, but you have only one month. So I said, OK, let's try it. And at the end, we actually managed to do it. It was a building of 154 rooms, student rooms. And I started uh, working with a social um, team to, to see how can we adapt this building in emergency accommodation. And at the end, we managed to, to create 220 uh, emergency accommodation for only families with 100 children. And uh, it was a success with the neighborhood because when you say to the neighborhood, OK, we will open an emergency building in front of your door, is are really scary. But we start with the Agence Intercalaire, talking with them, opening the building to the neighborhood, and developing also a workshop for the child. And at the end, it was a really a good success. And the government said, OK, we were OK for four months, using this building for four months. And at the end, they agreed to keep opening this building for more than one year. And what's really interesting is the the final project of renovation of this building is changing everything. This experimental occupation redefined the final uh, project. So other projects that I have is um, called Heureux, a concourse that I won in Toulouse with another t architecture team called AR357. And uh, it was the same. We start a diagnostic in the neighborhood to know what uh, was the opportunity for the people working there to develop their 
um, economy. So it's a social economy of composed of 10 uh, associations working on mobilities and bicycle and integration with uh, work. And we define with them um, a project really in in collaboration with the neighborhood and it's I think why we 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 win this project because we are in competition against two huge developers who decide to demolish all this part of the city in order to build a lot of housings but it was a really a, an issue because they were inside uh, 10 association developing our econo their economy with the neighborhood and with this kind of project of the developer, the rent that w they will ask after was uh, so expensive. So we handle with the people to find a way to keep the existing building, to renovate, auto-renovate the building with them and to to design uh, other spaces as, as housings and also a movie theater that we want as a, an experimentation of three years, step by step, we will collaborate with the neighborhood and the citizen to see how can we transform this building as a theater, but, but also as a restaurant, a library, and etc. Another uh, project is um, a stable, empty for more than a century. And it was an issue in this town because the, um, the town city was asking, okay, what can we do here? Uh, developer was okay. We can do 100 uh, housing there or more. And we finally find a team of citizens who just wanted to renovate this building in order to transform this castle above um, near the the stable as an equipment, a public equipment. So it's also a success to as an architect to manage to build also a team in order to do with them, to collaborate with them, to give them the tools in order to do their own project. And to conclude, I have also research project and I think it's a way how architects can also find new perspective. Here it's uh, a question about how can we feel at home when we are never actually at home. How can we feel at home when we are still and always moving for the job or for studies, etc.? And we did uh, 30 interviews and five immersion particip ob uh, observative observation in order to understand uh, how in the um, houses we can feel at home. So it's what I also use for the emergency accommodation to adapt the empty buildings in order to the people to feel really at home. So I, I will finish with this because we don't have time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Geoffrey. Uh, well, now we've got Alejandro and Bea from Nundo, uh, probably the only architecture office in the world that proposes every time to do nothing. <laughs> Okay, and the contradiction with that is that they work a lot, uh, trying to do less, the less possible, even nothing. So it's your turn. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, we'll try to explain what we do or what we don't do. And uh, first of all, we believe that we transform the world that really transforms us. So uh, this means that problems can be turned into challenges and challenges into opportunities. There you have some of them. We, we, we have to look at sustainability, security, equity, efficiency, mobility, inclusion, whatever. So new problems, new challenges, new opportunities, but still the song remains the same. And this means that architecture is being operating in the same way for the last 80, 50, 70 years, many, many times. So we think that it's time to look at problems in a different way. And this is how we started. We started working for the remaining 50% of the population of this world that cannot hire an architect, an urban planner, to have a proper dwelling, to have a proper place to live. And then we realized that it was possible to do many, many things with, with very, very little. 
And then we started to ask these questions to ourselves. I really like that in one of the presentations before that someone said that architecture is not about answers, but questions. So how would the status of the future be? And if you ask this question to uh, Google, who mostly masters everything, that's what they say. They said that this would be the, the, the status of the future, so fake 3D facades. And we think that Google is wrong, and it's not about dreaming futures of the city, but building future for the cities that we already have. We have problems, we have challenges, we have opportunities, so it's time to work what we have. We need to forget like these dreams on an empty paper. So, and we need to forget the assumption that we are what we do, because probably not. We are where we don't do. And this means that we can do better with less and even with nothing. Undoing, redoing, and not doing anything. And what, this, what does this mean? That we can build from subtraction. That we can first think and then propose and then activate things. Again, this is how we work, this is our office. We are a think tank, an urban experimentation center that then turn ideas into concrete proposals through a technical office. And we work towards real sustainability and this means economical sustainability, but also environmental, but also cultural and also social. We are tired of words being wasted. Sustainability has to be all these four things to be real. Then, yeah, then if you have another approach, you need another methodology, you need another way of confronting things. And these are the materials we like to work with. The pre-existence, we already have cities, buildings. I mean, the presentation before has, has been very, very inspiring of how we can work in, in empty places. Then we live in uncertainty. I mean, we know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but we don't know what's gonna happen in the following three years, two years. So we need to be flexible. I mean, we don't believe that we have to give the client close, perfect, finished solutions. We need to be flexible. And we need to in incorporate time as a material for our projects. This means that we can have all this feedback on how time develops the project and be flexible enough to redesign and reconsider our solutions. So that's what we give our clients, you know, a tool for decision making. And uh, yeah, so then what does this mean? Do not, not doing. It might sound negative, but it's not. I mean, no means to respect, to preserve and to protect. And I will show you afterwards a project that demonstrates the sustainability and the cost effectiveness of not doing. So again, questions. What are the benefits of not building? I invite you to think about this, I mean this evening when you go home. What are the benefits of not doing anything? Then undoing. Undoing means to reduce, to minimize, to eliminate, to dismantle, effectively responding to excess. If you look around, Barcelona, Manila, the countryside, Buenos Aires, wherever, excess is overwhelming. It's stepping on us every single day. So it's time to forget excess. And it's time to think, what do we need to eliminate to improve our environment? Again, please think about it. And then redo, I mean, reuse. I mean, the, the, the presentation before has been, it's been quite no, a, a good example of this. Regenerate, reverse, recover, revitalize, relocate. Again, valuing what we have. So how can a heritage be profitable? And it can be. It really can be. So again, more questions. It's not how we do things. It's time to forget the object. You know, architecture has been about how we do the object. Nice objects, nice egos. It's time to forget all that. And to ask ourselves this question, do we really have to do it? Because guys, we have the chance to say no. We can say no, I won't do it. I won't do it. If it's not useful, if it does not improve the life of the people, we don't need to do it. Let's say no, why not? So I'm gonna just show you an example because I mean, we were asked, have you worked in Europe? I mean, we've been working in, in, in some countries, especially in Ukraine <clears throat> and in Sweden. So I'm gonna show you this example about a project like urban, like a master plan we, we develop uh, with the Kalmar municipality. And it's about not doing. It's about protecting the landscape and not doing. So, a beautiful uh, wetland. In winter, it gets completely frozen. Then in summertime, it gets swampy. So 
the question, I mean, this comes from a competition, a European competition that we won. So the question was, how do we build in that place? It was a technical question, a complex question. So the best answer was, don't build there. You don't need to do that. Why? Don't do it. So don't, oops. Well, it's, it's uh, well, but here it says, don't build in the new areas. Okay, it's something, it's, it's, it's been lost. Uh, so don't build there. No, no, why would you build here? I mean, you already have a neighborhood here, which was really monofunctional. It was only residential, but don't build here. Just put more complexity and density there. So that was the second one. Oh, there you are. Dismantle the barriers in the environment. What was that? Here we had a, a road, a main road. So what we proposed was to divert this road and then turn this, that road into a street. And what was the benefit of that, of, of, that, of that elimination, sorry? That then you can easily cross and 10 minutes walk from your neighborhood, you have the wetland and the sea. So you have a park. Two simple operations. Don't build anything here, dismantle the road. Then you have a park for the neighborhood. And the third one, reuse empty spaces in the existing grid. So, what does that mean? That all the empty spaces we have, and then all the space that we get turning a road into a street, we're using it to have shops, coffee shops, schools, places for the elderly, like, you know, like, so put complexity there so people doesn't need to get the car to go and buy food. So then, I mean, you're turning a dispersed, a dispersed neighborhood into someone, to something which is compact and complex. And then, of course, well, that's another example of how we were using like the, the, the vacant space from the road when it was turned into street to have like all these new uses, even public space. So the thing is that these simple operations of subtracting and not doing generated an additional value to the neighborhood. Because instead of having a new place in the wetland, close to the sea, very expensive, and then, you know, minimizing and, and, and not having value on the, on, the, on the existing neighborhood, both, I mean, with, with these simple operations, the existing neighborhood then, then raised its value. So, subtraction and not doing again, saying no can generate value and profit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. Very inspiring. Uh, well, and now we go back from urban planning to architecture. We've got uh, Felipe from Fala. <clears throat> Fala is an architecture office in Porto of three people. Okay, uh, they dis they describe themselves as naive architecture office, uh, or another sentence I found in their website: they take lightness and joy very seriously. So. You can, by or through these two sentences, you can understand that they are, at the same time, very serious and, and very playful. So it's your turn. Thank you. So thank you, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. And um, yeah, indeed, we are a small office. Uh, we are based in Porto, in a quite fascinating economy at the time. Tourism rediscovered the city, at least that's how they frame it. And there's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of um, good and bad things happening at the same time. But the first question is who? Who are we? We are indeed three partners, but we have a team of 10 people. I'm the oldest, I'm 32, so we are very young. As you can imagine, experience is not our main strength. Valuing mistakes might be our main strength. Where Porto, and not Porto, the Porto of Seas or the Porto of Soto de Mor or the Porto of Sahal in the 60s. We are talking about the Porto of tourism, gentrification, Ryanair, and Airbnb. And when? Today. Uh, so at a time where sustainability, sustainability uh, social agendas, etc., start to be on the, on the regularly as a discourse topic, but to which, uh, and I will present a bit of that later, uh, we have very little to say. Um, and the first thing we have to say about ourselves is to understand that between the ten of us, uh, our education has been very diverse. We are the generation that did Erasmus, that studied abroad, that studied in Porto, Tokyo, Switzerland, Zurich, uh, Moscow, uh, the Netherlands. I mean, 
Between all of us, there are almost 40 nationalities in the last uh, five years, and there have been more than 50 schools. So we can conclude that probably there's more than one answer to the same, to the same question. Besides that, uh, and again, keeping in mind that ex experience is not our main strength, we had the opportunity to work in very interesting and diverse offices. We had a traditional education, so we followed a traditional path. Let's try to work for our heroes. So between, again, Switzerland, the US, Japan, Portugal also, we had the opportunity to collect, on top of the previous academic experience, a lot of very interesting professional experience. So in that sense, we are just as everyone else from our age these days. And at the same time, we collected uh, unique personal experiences from living you know, in a historical icon in Japan to being DJs on Saturday evenings. Uh, we found out that there's more to architecture than the architecture itself, and one way or another, this impacts the production, and the production impacts this. But more important, and this is where it gets funny, we started to understand that the ten of us uh, shared a degree of geekiness that is uncomparable. We are architectural geeks before being architects. We are, uh, I wouldn't use the word research, I would call it more like a hobby. It's more a thing we do for fun. And we have our own heroes. So we started understanding that our practice, before being a social practice of any sort, was a kind of religious institution devoted to our own demigods. And these demigods, they are people that work in a very different time from ours, that is educated in a very different context, and that operate in a completely different scale. Some of them still alive, thankfully, and fortunately some of them already passed. But they are, to a certain extent, the examples we look up to. So our practice is an inclusive practice. It's a practice that looks at precedent and takes precedent as the best example of how to produce new content. And this is where the author happens. This is our office. This is where we somehow navigate. Uh, well, this is actually a lie because we changed the office a few months ago, but we don't have a good photo of the new one. Uh, <laughs> so this is our previous office. And um, we all work around a very small table. These were about 20, 25 square meters where 10 people, clients, engineers, contractors, all of them met together, where the discussions happen uh, in one tone where uh, the heroes, the gods, were depicted, analyzed, transformed, recycled, proposed in new uh, shapes and forms. And this was the, let's say, the liturgy. This was the, the, the production we achieved from it. For several years, we have been trying, you know, we like to say we have been faking until we made it. We have been trying to produce architecture, most of the times via um, competitions. Uh, via the promise that between those 350 people, we are going to be the one that will prevail, that will build a museum. We were wrong. Uh, we lost all the time. And we learned, ironically, that maybe these competitions were going to take us somewhere, because the ambition that our teacher gave us and our heroes gave us, that we are going to be the stars of the future, we're going to build the big public institutions, we are going to somehow change the public space, was actually a lie. But there were a lot of small private clients that needed to transform their backyards, that needed to extend their kitchens, that needed to somehow renovate their bathrooms. And this is where we found our opportunity. This is where we actually understood that maybe there is a second world to architecture that is not the one that our teachers gave us. It's not like we felt betrayed, but we felt like we were smarter than them. We are going to take the commissions that they wouldn't. If we don't have the commissions they have, because indeed they work in a very different time than the time we live today, we're going to find our own commissions and create value from them. And the ironic side of this is that we accumulated, we lost so many of the first that we devoted ourselves to the second, and we did so much of the second, and now we are at the stage where we are invited to build the first. So it's a very subversive path. Um, and simultaneously as this happens, we find ourselves in this very ironic position as teachers. So as if we had something to tell, as if we had something to teach. We tell about our mistakes, we tell about our disappointments, we also tell about our small victories. And maybe if we don't have the big victory every week, we have a small victory once in a while. And that's, as you see, most of the times our teaching takes this shape. It's about going to the garden, sitting down and having Ahmed explaining to a group of second year students why the Villa Malaparte is the Villa Malaparte. Because very few people have the opportunity to find out about the Villa Malaparte for the first time. And having the opportunity to tell someone about it, it's quite unique. And this is a kind of teaching we like to do, mostly around, again, these religious figures we respect so much. And let's face it, it's ironic that no one used the word internet today. Uh, we live in a time where information flies faster than ever. 
buildings that are not built are already old in our eyes because we know them, we visited them, I mean, never physically, but intellectually. We already know the architecture before the architecture happens. And the internet, Instagram, Facebook, all of those media platforms became the most powerful tool of them all. As I said, we faked it until we, faked it until we made it, and the internet was our main ally. And at the same time, it's fascinating to find out that uh, the work of an office that has pretty much produced nothing can become the result of an exhibition, of a publication, of uh, any kind of these things. But indeed, as we accumulated more and more of this, of this, of this uh, small bathrooms, kitchens, and renovations for tourists, so our clients are not social, they are actually small promoters that want to make money from the gentrification process in Porto, we got to the point where we somehow had enough material to research ourselves to understand that maybe in between all of this production there is a depiction that can be made of our own work, there's, there's, a, there's a catalogation that we can do, and ironically again, what was never planned ended up resulting in something bigger than we ever imagined it could be. So I would like to say that, uh, and this is not a provocation, it's a very honest statement in comparison to most of the presentations we saw today, we couldn't care less about any political attitude. We don't care about any social agenda. As a practice, I mean. Individually, we might have strong opinions on that, but as a practice, there was never a day where we discussed the footprint that one of our buildings will leave in the environment. We never did it, and I bet that no one else until two years ago. It's a very recent thing. It's a very um, Facebook-promoted business, in our perspective. And I know it's very... I put myself in a very dangerous position by saying that in a stage like this, but indeed in recent events, we have been asked several times about it, and we always feel very discomfortable because it's not a topic we discuss at all. So what topic do we discuss? We discuss with our clients how to make a small house with small money. We discuss with our clients how to finish the abandoned structures from the 80s in the suburbs and how to somehow complete constructions that no other architect, promoter or client wanted to do in the past. We somehow try to explain to our clients that if they don't have the money to do a good, back, a good front facade, they can do a good back facade. It's the same. It's the same because it's their house. They don't care about what the public sees, they care about what they see. It's about doing social housing for a quarter of the price of social housing in Portugal. It's, I would say, social. We don't see it as such, but it is a bit. It's about somehow telling the clients that their own house, uh, be it in concrete, metal, or plaster, is still just a house. So let's make the best house possible, and let's hope that in the future someone else, if not them, will appreciate it as much as they do. It's about designing our own office and finding out that we did it, you know, we made it. We don't need to fake it anymore. We have an office, we have a space, we have a house. It's about, it's about once in a while, because we did so many bathrooms, being invited by a cultural institution to do a small folie to put an art piece in it. It's, uh, I mean, I have several other examples, but I don't think the point is to, to go through all of them. But it's about understanding that most of the times uh, we are asked for very practical examples, like, as I said before, how to extend a kitchen or a bathroom. And we end up proposing a full project, a full experience on how to occupy a space, on how to occupy a house, how to somehow give any life to that, to, that new, to that new building that is actually an old building. And other times it's about uh, funny, happy accidents that result from, from this. But in all cases, we always do two things as a kind of uh, double personality thing. We provide the client with what the client asked for. If he asks for a house, he gets a house, he doesn't get a museum. So if he asks for a, an amazing bathroom, we try to understand what is the best possible bathroom we can do. So we don't try to tell him that's boring or annoying. I don't want to do a bathroom. No, that's the commission we have, that's the commission we do. But we give them also an architecture that was not asked for. So we give them our own architecture, we give them our own agenda. As long as we don't hurt them, they let us do it. As long as the Excel sheets from the promoters are fulfilled, the language is our playground. As long as the bathroom is outstanding, they would be fine with patterns, joy and lightness. So we try to do that. And in a conclusion, just to, to go back to what we believe could be a proposal for a debate like this. All of our clients, they are not art collectors, they are not rich people, they are indeed uh, the bottom of the pyramid. So they are the people that come to us because they heard we are cheap, fast, young, moldable. So they are the people that come to us not because they want follow, but because someone gave them my phone number or Anna's phone number and told them these guys will be faster than the other ones you talked about before. So these are people that don't have any expectation regarding architecture. These are probably people that never use the word architecture, like we do. The word architecture has been said by me 20 times in the last 10 minutes, by everyone else 2,000 times today. An average person doesn't use the word architecture probably five times in their whole life. 
So if there's a thing I believe we make as a mistake, not just European Union, architects in general, is that we as architects talk about architecture without our architects. We don't open the sphere. The general population couldn't care less about architecture. You know, the architecture we discuss is not the architecture they care about. I know this because I have parents that are not architects and they don't care at all. They don't. My brother doesn't care. No one cares. It's, 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 really, it's really sad to put it like this, but it's true that they work with us and at the end the clients say there's something more to this than I was expecting. At that moment, for the first time, after they spend all their money in their retirement home, they care a bit and then they forget about it. Because we as architects are in a closed bubble, so if there's a thing that I believe that could be a topic of discussion would be how can we architects in events like this where I bet 90% of the room is architects, open the sphere so that the general population cares, not as much as we do, but a bit about architecture as much as we do. And that would be my proposal. Thank you so much. Okay, Felipe, thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring as well. In fact, as, as I said at the beginning, you're very serious, but at the same time, there was an irony all the time in your words. Um, okay, so we, we opened the debate. I think that the four... Okay. <laughs> okay. Someone. So there were four different short lectures, uh, all of them really interesting. So many uh, issues, aspects appeared. Uh, Feel free to ask. Hi. Um, Please, could you say who you are when you ask a question? Uh, my name is Alia. I'm a um, representative of all the young architects in Germany. I hope so. <laughs> Here. So first of all, thank you everybody for really interesting panel session. I just wanted to go back to the last um, statement that people don't care about architecture. I live in Stuttgart. I don't know if you heard of it, but right now, for the past couple of years, they're building a new uh, train station. What is fascinating, maybe it's because we have lots of architects in Stuttgart, but each Monday there is a... Um, there is public meeting and there is a protest of people against building this train station. So, so far they're about in a meeting 763 or something and they're still debating and they're still protesting like normal people are going on the street because they are saying, okay, we feel that this money could have been used differently. So what I wanted to say, people do care about architecture but how can we motivate them to think it in a different way. There are, in Germany, there are lots of debates about whether 980 million for Elbphilharmonie were actually used well, whether so many billion euros spent for the new train station in Stuttgart could have been used in Stuttgart for other purposes. So instead of just um, asking public or seeing that the public is opposing it because they think that the money can be used differently, maybe we can motivate them to think about architecture in different ways. So I wanted to ask you guys, how would you um, see when the architecture becomes political in a way, how you would react to it? Thanks. Can you hear me? Ah. Maybe the money can be spent in a better way. That's probably the conclusion. But I don't know because I don't know, I don't know the, the, the train station in question. But you're talking about, in both cases, about what we could call public structures, public buildings built with public money that is coming from taxes. And I could also argue that probably you have 0.01% of the population of Stuttgart in that event, which still doesn't prove a rule, it proves an exception. But I'm not going that way. I'm going to go in what I know. And what I know is my own uh, or our, as a practice, experience that collides with the private sector, so not the public sector. Uh, because architecture, well, CISA has a saying that is very nice. He says that architecture costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. 
And we are not the one bringing the money, so we are just the ones who play with the money. So in order to be a successful architect to a certain extent, you need to have someone with a lot of money that you can play with, because otherwise you just do beautiful drawings, but they don't come out of the table. And when it can becomes private, so when people bring their own money, so when it's not public, you would expect that they would care more. You would expect that they would be engaged because they want to be part of the process. They want to somehow engage with the, you know, the guy that they don't know for less than two weeks that is going to spend all their money, but they don't. They, they expect that the Pinterest photo they showed you is going to be fulfilled on the kitchen. They expect that. But when you start talking about architecture, how to use the space, how to potentiate their own life routines, they don't. And that's the experience I can, I can, I can talk about. So I don't understand yet the concept of public infrastructure because I never operated in it. But on the small scale, bottom of the pyramid, private infrastructure, they don't care. I can assure you this. In 25, 30 clients, there's not a single one that uses the word architecture. They don't. They ask us for the budget. Contractor, when does it start? When is it ended? And we say, what about the project? And they say, what project? We don't care about project. Let's build a house. It's, this is the economy in which we live. And I would be, of course I'm generalizing and making a, most, a, mock, uh, a, a joke out of it, but I would say that 99% of the architecture worldwide has more of this and less of those 700 people complaining in the Stuttgart station. I would suggest that. It's a personal. Um, according to me, it's what we have in France. You know, we have a lot of um, people fighting about new airport, uh, new public equipment, and I think architect can give the tools to the people, a method to take the power, and I don't know to give other studies and to show to the public, to the government, how can we do totally differently the project to save money, save time, and avoid uh, our design sustainable project. So it's what I think as a, I don't know, a positive way we, we can propose alternatives to the top-down project and help people to design bottom-down project and alternatives. Yeah, I think, I think, oh, sorry, yeah, it's a bit too loud. Uh, I think that maybe people doesn't care, but, but I think if you just ask them, they will answer. I mean, they will answer back. I mean, we have experienced this in, in many like participation processes that when you ask people, they have an opinion, they have something to say. And maybe it's true that there's like a huge gap between this venue, architects talking about architecture and with a, with a capital letter. But I think when you go, I mean, and you go to a neighborhood or you talk to people and you, uh, and you ask questions, they, they answer, they have an opinion, they have something to say. And I think this is maybe something that we're missing. I mean, we just lost completely in our thoughts in our office without going out, you know, on the streets and asking people. Uh, I, I would suggest that we need to be more, uh, I mean, open and, and less uh, maybe, you know, like uh, endogamic, if, uh, if, if you allow me to say that. Um, I, was, I was thinking, I was remembering that um, several days ago, like on Thursday or on Wednesday, we were in a, um, in a meeting, in a celebration for the 10th anniversary of an association in Madrid called Madrid Ciudadanía y Patrimonio. It's like Madrid, um, how do you say, Ciudadanía, citizen, um, yes, and uh, heritage. Uh, yeah, and heritage. And it's an association, and it's a 10 years old association uh, made of people, not only architects, but people from the street that really cares about the architecture in the city. And they, they are very strong and they are always working because they really care what's happening in the city with the architecture. But not only with the churches, churches on, I don't know, the, the palaces or something, but also with, um, with the normal architecture, the neighborhood architecture. Because for them it's important. So I think, yeah, uh, they really care sometimes. <laughs> If 
if I can add something to what you're saying uh, about knowing about architecture or not by people that are not architects. I work in an association that tries to put in contact the knowledge of architecture with society, with people. <laughs> and from, uh, through all the activities we've organized during the last 10 years also, because we've been working for 10 years, uh, I can say to you that in fact people know much more about architecture than what we thought and that, than what they think. Uh, they don't know that they know a lot about architecture. People don't know that they know a lot, but they, know, they do. They do because we, as someone said now or before, I don't remember, uh, we always live in, we spend 90% of our time in buildings or in cities. Uh, we experience how we feel in different kind of spaces, in different kind of streets, in different kind of parks, whatever. And from this experience, we learn a lot. But this experience and all this knowledge we accumulate maybe has never been awakened to people that are not architects, I'm talking. Okay? Uh, so they don't know they've got all this experience, all this knowledge that has been accumulating years over years, no? during all her, their lives. So sometimes our, uh, how to say that, our, I don't find the word, not even in Catalan. <laughs> Our goal should be uh, awaking this knowledge, make them conscious that they know a lot about architecture, and uh, uh, that they, they can have strong opinions about what they want and how they, um, where they feel better, for example. Okay. Yeah. We can just add, I think there are perhaps two ways of caring about architecture. You can care conscious and outspoken, but also unconscious. You can care about architecture, and I think most people react to space. Okay, well, are there any questions? I have the question. Could you, you say who you are? Uh, I'm Alexander Schwab from Munich in Bavaria, or Germany. <coughs> the Bavarian is first a Bavarian, <laughs> then a German. Um, do you feel moved by Greta Thunberg? And uh, do you have any conclusions about this issue. Okay. No. <laughs> I, I actually thought you asked if we, f if we feel moved by Peter Sumter and I would uh, say yes, but I think actually my, my experience, uh, personal experience and also from um, like like my um, relatives and people around me, I think at least in Denmark, it really changed within the last year. There's a new average about these issues. Of course, they were there before Thunberg, and she's not, you know, the reason for it, but she's a kind of catalyst for this. So actually, I think there's a before and after, but it has a lot to do with like a kind of common. Um, discussion and um, and awareness of to do something or not to do something or what to do. And I don't think we are yet at all there where we have the answers of how to react and how to solve these uh, sustainable issues. But to have the discussion started uh, for real, I think is a very important beginning. Well, I, I guess that when you say moved means like you inspired or something like that. I I would say that I, we might be inspired by some of the buildings of Peter Thumter, but I will also say that it's it's we believe it's time to kill our idols, absolutely. So, not by the figure of Peter Thumter, maybe some some of the works of he has done, but but yeah, I would say yeah, yeah kill your idols. That that, that would be <laughs> my opinion. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. I thought it, he was a, oh, by Greta, boo. That, that's much more difficult. <laughs> then I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> we, we really thought it was Peter Thumter. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. I don't know if you asked about Greta Thunberg to introduce a theme like the environment, climate change, uh, how, how to deal with that to, uh, as architects, uh, because the answer was very direct about Greta Thunberg or Peter Zumthor, <laughs> but not about the environmental issue in general. So maybe you can add something about how you deal with that in your projects, how you uh, deal with climate change, the destruction of the environment, uh, all these kind of things. Um, for me, it's to think how we can try to build less. It's about your presentation also to do not build a new project if you don't need really it. So that's my answer. I, I I would say that it's I don't I don't want to sound wrong, but the strategy for a project is not always the same, and there have been projects um, from our practice and from several other practices that had severe construction that were positive, valuable, necessary. There have been projects that were refurbishment, transformations, the same, necessary, valuable, important. And there have been projects like this one you just showed, this competition, that's an outstanding strategy. That's a good answer to a question that was not asked. But I would not vilify the idea of new construction. Because in, in the time we live in, we are polarizing all the topics. Today it's either extreme left, extreme right, either an ecologist or destroying the planet. You don't have, you don't have an in-between condition. Mm -hmm. And the world changed, everything changed, and it is important to understand that one thing will not replace the other. It never has been like that. There's a, there's a middle ground, there's a gray zone. It's not either or, it's both and. So I think sometimes in all the topics, sustainability topics is just one of several, but it's too polarized. Everything is too political these days in that sense. Either you are against or you are in favor. There's no middle ground. Yeah, well. I think uh, for, for us, for Nundo, I think that that's one of the bases, the base. Um, I mean, we work, we try to work from architecture and from urbanism uh, to improve people's life. The best is the, the, the first line for, for an architect, no? we think. Uh, but in a healthy environment, I mean, it's the, the two faces of the same coin, no? or I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose that we can't not look to another side when we have these kind of problems. And from architecture and from, from urbanism, I think uh, we think we really have to give uh, global answers because we are in a global world. So, yeah. Um, if I can add something, because I think it was a very uh, inspiring um, presentation you had, and I think indeed there are many. Uh, cases where you can, uh, for good ans answer, uh, ask if you really need to do, for instance, to build new. But I have to say that I don't think that you always can avoid building new. Um, so to get back to the question about um, yeah, the big uh, word sustainability, in, in our office we don't believe that it's something on its own, it should be something integrated in the project, um, like stability and uh, and the functionality and and the fire issues if like like everything that you need to solve in a building so one way that we are trying to work with sustainability is that we try to optimize um, and we don't do it only because um, of less use of material but also because we find an architectonic um, um, that we, we are looking for something in our architecture to really get into the point and not add extra layers in our buildings. Um, and in that sense, um, use less material, but also um, make a very simple building in the end. It might not be simple to get to this answer, but um, in the end, we try to, uh, to really optimize the building. Okay, just, just one second. Uh, uh, I, I was just going to ask, um, well, to introduce the public that is following the the, um, the debate through streaming uh, or via streaming. There's a question for Felipe. 
Okay, very precise. And it says, how your team faces the architectural tradition and architectural background that Portugal and, that, and the Porto School in particular have? Who asked? <laughs> Adrian, Adriana. Um, so I don't think, so this, these are two different questions. One is about how do we address I would say in a generic term, the heritage or the value of the buildings we intervene in. Uh, that is, they are in Porto, but I wouldn't make it specific of Porto. So I would say that the, if, you, if you intervene in a given structure from the 18th, 19th, 20th century, we would have the same position into a building from 2002 or to a building from 1852, which is if there are elements that truly give us an added value for the final project, we will preserve it, emphasize them, even make the whole project around them. If there are elements that are on the way of a better project, just because they are old, we're not going to preserve them. So there's this, uh, also it's, an, it's a different topic, and in this one we are more fluent because it's a very Porto-centric topic, this idea of preserving everything. Um, but I would say that if there's an added value in something to be preserved, it should. If it's on the way of a better response to the problem that is being asked, it should, it should be taken away. On the lineage of the Porto School, we study there, me and Anna. We are hardcore fanatics of the, 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 the school itself. We still believe that Cisa is by far one of the most important architects of the last century, probably the most relevant architect alive. But we also believe that there are other names we can look into. And as I said, we are very inclusive. So we respect as much uh, this Porto tradition as we respect the Zurich tradition, as we respect individual names from Japan, as we respect you know, fellow colleagues of our age. So it's not a old people thing. So I would say that uh, respect, yes, but not exclusivity. Thank you. So I think you've, oh, sorry, um, Judith Kimpian, Chair of the Architects Council of Europe's um, Environment and Sustainable Architecture Workgroup. Um, you've all talked extremely eloquently about um, improving people's lives and, uh, and working with them and using their feedback on how to do that. Um, and also often thinking outside the box. And I was wondering on a very mundane level whether you feel equipped to specify materials that have very low environmental impacts, whether you feel um, empowered to control the technology that goes into buildings and how occupants might relate to those. And, and what do you think the regulators and what, what do you think can be done to help you have a better command of these decisions? I think that's a good enough answer in many ways. Uh, <laughs> I think we're also trying to be polite to letting uh, <laughs> each other talk. I think, for instance, in Denmark, the concrete industry is extremely dominant, in uh, at least in uh, larger scale projects. And um, one of the reasons, one of many reasons, is that's it, that it's extremely cheap. Um, so we have seen a lot of uh, taxes, regulations, and other kind of unsustainable uh, things, you know, like petrol for the cars for many years. So just one simple thing by adding, for instance, a tax on concrete, I think that would already change. I know that's that uh, probably a lot of issues about this. Um, it's political, but um, I think uh, that's maybe one of many <laughs> uh, solutions to be uh, very specific. I was, I was going to, I mean, we were, we were talking about this thing like in the break. So two possible things would be like more investment in research because architecture is not only about, again, sorry to be, I mean, that, that, that's stubborn, but it's not only about doing, but also about thinking. So uh, that would be one. And the other one probably would be not to, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, how to say this, not, not, yeah, not, not to vinculate, or, I mean, the money you earn, depending on how many square meters you build. That would be a change of paradigm. I mean, because I mean, people normally in other professions is paid for their people is paid for their ideas, and we are just paid for what we build. I mean, we 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 are paid for for the, the square meters we, we construct. So I mean, we can we can look at different options. And, and architects, I think, are we are good thinkers, so we we can be paid for our ideas as well. A European concrete tax, is that, uh, what do you think about this? <laughs> okay, any other questions? We're just on time now, so maybe we can just stop. Ah, one more, okay, the last one. Hey, um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I study here. Um, I'm from Israel. Um, you know, our cities like constantly evolve and develop, and buildings faster and faster, losing and changing their functionalities. Like, and throughout all of those things, it lives like um, our cities as internal uh, working site you know so where does it where like how do you think that it affect architecture in the future um, i don't know if you understand what i mean <laughs> could you just be more precise <laughs> Like the idea that we constantly changing faster and faster, and like you design one thing, but a decade after its functionality is completely different. You walk in the street and it's like a, a, a working site, like the train and the building and the facade and whatever. Like, um, how do you think architecture should adapt to it, like in the close future? Mm -hmm. Well, at, you, at least you gave some answers at the beginning, no? During your presentation. I don't know if you want to... Yeah, well, we, were, we were talking before that uh, 10 minutes is few time for explaining uh, the work of uh, almost nine years. <laughs> so, um, talking about what you are saying, um, we brought this book, this small book, <laughs> and... Uh, we, we um, produced uh, two years ago or three years ago. And we tried to, in, the, in this small book, we tried to answer some of the, this, those questions, no? Because it's not so easy. Um, but uh, we think that we have to stop. And what, that's what we tried uh, several years ago, to stop and think uh, before continuing building and continuing doing and not knowing uh, what, what's next, no? So, so uh, what we tried from Nundo, we tried to stop and think. So we developed this book and um, yeah, we are working on it. <laughs> yes, I just want to add that I think it's also an opportunity for architects to find new resources because everything goes fast, faster and faster. So maybe we can find also materials not too old in the buildings that we can reuse on other projects. And it's how, it's what I try to do in Toulouse to see, okay, you have a building only 10 years old, they will transform it. How can we can still reuse uh, the windows or I don't know, materials as new resources for another project. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, to be a bit more precise, I mean, I, I think, uh, as Sam was mentioning, I, I tried to explain that very, very fast, but we are providing, like, I mean, to the client, we are not providing, like, a closed, you know, finished uh, thing. We are just providing a tool for decision-making. So, 
uh, we provide many like a battery of solutions that can be implemented you know a long a long time so depending on the the impact and the interest of the client the money they have and the time of implementation they can choose between this battery of solutions which one fits and which one is necessary at, at that time i mean at, at that precise moment so you don't need to do the whole thing like in one year and finish the project completely but you can develop the project i mean along along the time so Maybe today you can choose solution one, one, seven, and 25, and then next year you have more money, or your interests and your priorities have changed, then, can you, and then you can implement solution 35, 58, and 69. So that's, that's how we are, because I mean, this is a question that we have, we have asked ourselves many times. And, uh, and especially, I think it's, at least in Spain, it's quite dramatic with urban planning that you find these huge boxes you know, full of, you know, drawings and drawings, which are never implemented because, I mean, either solutions are too complex or they, co I mean, or too expensive that nothing is done. So uh, we, we've tried to change also the format in which we, we I mean, give the, the client a solution by giving many solutions that can be implemented in, along the time. And I, I don't know if this goes completely in the direction of your question, but we are making the, the traditional architecture mistake. We are talking about the architect as this god figure that alone will bring the solution. We are part of an industry. The city has thousands of layers of industry. It's like a big onion of layers of actors, figures, from naturally architects and engineers and you know the people that somehow plan, but also to political thinkers that are not architects, to political figures that are not thinking, to uh, promoters that have a business, construction companies that belong to an industry that has millions of jobs, to finally the very small private client that saw that house on that TV show and wants to build that house. So all of these people are together. So again, let's not fall on this mistake of assuming that we are the person, that the, the master that enters the room and says, this is how it will be, and things happen. It's not like that. It's not, because we are playing, again, with other people's money, be it the state or private. We are playing with a lot of people. We are not playing alone, you know, in a corner with a ball. No, there's a lot of players on the, t on the, on the, on the field. So it is important to demystify this discourse where, again, architects are talking about the architecture solution for the architecture problem of the planet to other architects. This is a disease of the discipline. We need to spread. We need to understand that there are more and more people that should be here and are not, and there are too many people that are here and should be talking with other people outside. This is, this is, uh, these two worlds, they never come together. It's very difficult to do that. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, uh, everyone of you and you. Uh, we, we stop here and then we continue again at 14.30, okay? <laughs>